Dr. Deutsch's talk this evening is entitled Making Change at the Grocery Store, The Politics of Provisioning in the 20th Century. Tracy is very well suited to speak on this topic as her recent book, Building a Housewife's Paradise, Gender, Government, and American Grocery Stores, 1919 to 1968, won the Best Book Award from the American Society of Food Studies in 2010. Dr. Deutsch's work emphasizes the gendered dimensions of, of food shopping, the transformative efforts of, uh, effects of large streamlined grocery stores, and the limits of mass consumption. And I am convinced that I will never think of the neighborhood Dillons in quite the same way after tonight. So if you'd please join me in welcoming Dr. Tracy Deutsch. I am thrilled to be here today. And I want to begin by thanking Amy Geist of the Ulrich <laughs> and Dr. Robin Henry for being my liaison today, as well as the community of readers and graduate students and members of the History and Women's Studies departments, as well as the staff of the Ulrich for being so incredibly welcoming. I am genuinely honored and inspired that so many of you came out tonight and engaged with my work. And I'll say I will talk as quickly as I can so that we have time for Q&A at the end. Um, this is an exciting exhibit for several reasons. The pieces themselves are, of course, striking, but their curation and conception is really energizing to me. Each of these artists reframes the everyday. And I think the juxtaposition of these pieces lets us see the centrality of stores themselves and their significance in our lives. This thoughtful display speaks to the strangeness of the everyday. And I think it also speaks to the everyday, everydayness of strangeness. Um, grocery stores in an everyday way require effort, um, but supply far more than food. Indeed, I think they supply far more than we usually imagine. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to visit the exhibit and get to know the museum better. And I thought I'd start by sharing this print by Ben Sean. Um, this is my personal favorite pieces of supermarket art. So I'll just leave it up there for a minute. Um, I share the general belief that grocery stores are wonderful places for asking other questions about power and who has it, about what counts as a commodity and what doesn't, about health and how we obtain it, and how food reflects class and religion and politics. Stores are particularly useful because they force us to connect the economic with the social. These are systems that we often treat separately, but which come to a head around questions of, say, what we'll buy for dinner. The anthropologist Claude Levi-Strauss is credited with saying, food is good to think with. And I passionately believe that the places in which food is bought and sold are also good to think with. So above and beyond all else, I hope that this art and my talk encourage you to see grocery stores as sites where these important questions can be asked, as places where connections between economy and society, between individuals and larger systems, systems of exchange, of race, of gender, of government, are undermined, reinforced, subverted, and strengthened. The questions I asked in my own project, or the question I asked was, how did these stores, the settings and causes for much of this art, how did they happen in the first place? Supermarkets are notoriously distinctively American, and they are also quite distinctive in the history of grocery stores. So how did we get them? Where did they come from? I want to stop for a second um, and explain a bit about how I'm using these terms. Briefly, I want to distinguish between grocery stores, which I use to encompass all kinds of stores that sell food for use in the home, and supermarkets, which are a particular kind of store that emerged in the US in the mid 20th century. You'll also hear me distinguish chain stores from supermarkets, since not all supermarkets were parts of chains. I make these distinctions um, not just because I'm a persnickety historian, but also because um, I want to make the broader point about the diversity of formats that exist in grocery stores. I strive for precision as a way of talking more usefully about the different kinds of formats, aesthetics, looks, offerings, and methods of grocery stores 
and the ways that these don't always map onto our ideas of what a supermarket has to look like. So I'm trying to make a broader point that we can imagine grocery stores operating in all kinds of different ways. My question about supermarkets' origins proved to be more complicated than I'd anticipated, so I'm going to divide my talk into a section that narrates the profound change that happened to stores between roughly 1900 and 1950, and then a separate section that analyzes how stores and their histories were discussed as supermarkets were coming to dominate the market in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, changes to stores themselves and also how we talk about them shape the retail landscape that we confront today. So to illustrate how profound the change to grocery stores was, I want to start with two very different descriptions of food shopping. These were written about 60 years apart. One, the first comes from one of the most popular exposés of advertising, which was Vance Packard's The Hidden Persuaders. Vance Packard became a very well-known critic of consumption and consumerism in the 50s and 60s, and this was the book that launched his career. In it, he documented the subtle and sometimes subliminal marketing methods of package designers, psychologists, producers of advertising copy, and retailers. This is the cover of the book, and you can, you can sort of peruse the text as I'm talking, and you'll see sort of the, his themes emerge. For Packard, food epitomized the problems he was describing. And he repeatedly reinforced the idea that food shopping especially was a mindless pursuit and that women grocery store shoppers were helpless in the face of marketers' techniques. He called his chapter on supermarkets, and I'm not making this up, babes in consumer land. And he painted an image of women mesmerized by what he called the, quote, fairyland of colorful and well-stocked shelves that women walked through in a trance-like state, so distracted by sto the store that, quote, they passed by neighbors and old friends without noticing or greeting them. There's a lot, one might say, about Packard's observations, including his implication that men were somehow untouched by this. But there's also something very familiar in his notion that shopping is, for better or worse, relaxing, mindless, and detached. These have become quite common ways to think about consumption and consumer culture. For now, I want to point out that this description of typical food shopping, a description that proved quite resonant in the 1950s, stood in striking contrast to earlier images and understandings. So I want to push us back further. At the turn of the 20th century, food shopping and women food shoppers were presented as, for lack of a better word, gritty and assertive. In 1896, a journalist called food shopping, quote, one of the most exacting demands of housekeeping. Placing orders with stores, either via delivery boys or over the telephone, could lead to subpar foods arriving at one's doorstep. If one sallied forth oneself, the well-meaning housewife found, quote, the task of spending money scarcely less laborious than the task of earning it. Such a job required being able to leave home just after breakfast or risk limited selection and long lines later in the day. Then, she continued, there is the friction of discussing the demerit of items previously delivered and the often fruitless effort to secure just what is desired. Even women who had time for this face-to-face -face bargaining found it, quote, a weariness to the flesh. Food shopping in this iteration was not fun, nor was it systemized, nor was it meant to be. Indeed, it was precisely its importance that required that labor, that effort, that mindfulness. So how did women go from being active, if exhausted, provisioners to babes in consumer land? And did they? I argue, and I'll argue today, that it was not women that changed, nor really even entirely the work of shopping. That is, it's not that work disappeared. Rather, the way we think about shopping and grocery stores and our expectations of both were what changed. By the mid-20th century, supermarkets could make a kind of sense and could resonate in powerful ways 
because analysts, grocers, and policymakers had come to expect less individuality of women shoppers and more predictable consumption. Indeed, they had come to depend on more predictable consumption for systems of governance and distribution and the economy. The world described in these earlier quotes was one of dense networks of food distribution. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many Americans continued to raise important amounts of their food, either in kitchen gardens, if they lived in rural areas, or in backyards in urban areas. And one thing historians are starting to figure out is how much food was still produced by people themselves up through the early decades of the 20th century. Others purchased food from neighborhood peddlers or from farmers or public markets. This is a picture of a produce market in Chicago at the turn of the century. Um, these open markets were particularly common in cities, although market towns existed all over the United States. And indeed, markets were often the first, one of the first public institutions created when a town was founded. And of course, many Americans, regardless of where they lived, bought food for grocery stores. I want you to imagine, though, that there were lots of different places from which people provisioned themselves. I also want you to imagine that these were tiny businesses, um, certainly by our standards, but even by the standards of the time. In the 1920s, a model grocery store, one that grocers were encouraged to build, was a little over 1,000 square feet. So you can imagine something much smaller than this room that we're in. Chains were often only a few hundred square feet, so they were even smaller. And these included storage rooms, countertops, and any stock at all. Average sales of these stores were low, too. An average grocery store in Chicago in 1929 made a little over $13,000. And that's sales. That's not profit. That was their total sales for the year. Most of these corner stores were what we would call independents. They were operated by their owners who oversaw one or maybe a few stores, most of them in, this, in the same part of a city or town. But early chain stores were also quite small. Um, this is a picture of an early A&P, um, which was one of the first chains. And I just want to point out, as you look at this, that um, A&P only occupied this window. The much larger storefront is vacant in that picture. So they're just one storefront wide, and it's not that deep of a building. Grocery stores were small, largely because it was assumed that grocers had to have individual knowledge of customers in order to do business. Business consultant Christine, Christine Frederick warned grocers in 1925 that women inevitably would want attention when they shopped. Women, she said, liked to complain about a previous purchase or ask advice before making another. Just a few years later, the Department of Commerce warned would-be grocers not to hurry a woman in the interests of efficiency because they stood to lose her business by insulting her. In spite, or maybe because, of their grinding pace and small size, grocery stores were still big business. Although each store was very small, the total amount of money involved in selling food made retail grocery stores the biggest retail sector in the United States in terms of sales for much of the 20th century. So although storefronts were very small, they were extraordinarily important in people's daily lives and also in local, regional, and national economies. The large amount of sales reflected a large number of stores. In an urban area, these stores would have been within a few blocks and certainly within walking distance of almost any urban house. So grocery stores were often scattered, even through neighborhoods that we would consider mostly residential. Um, there were, what this meant in terms of numbers is that there were far more grocery stores than exist now, at least as separate businesses. Um, in the first U.S. Census of retail, there were close to, th there were over 300,000 grocery stores across the country. And just to give you some comparison, um, in 2011, which was the most recent year I could find numbers for, there were 92,000 grocery stores. So that's about two-thirds less. Now, each store is larger, but there's many fewer of them. <laughs> 
Stores were also important for reasons so obvious it's easy to overlook. For many Americans, and especially for urban Americans, corner stores were literally how one got one's daily food. Also, because stores offered credit, they could be vital resources in making it until payday. So these stores provided food, but they were also often important parts of general support networks in people's lives. They allowed survival during hard as well as good times. Individual encounters were at the heart of these stores. More often than not, people requested what they wanted from a clerk, who then fetched it from a back room or from inaccessible shelving. Prices were rarely marked on goods. And this, the necessity of having a good relationship with a clerk was heightened through particular services. So almost every grocery store offered delivery or later on telephone orders um, in which the customer was utterly dependent on the judgment of a store employee or owner. Clerks chose the brand that they sold, what it cost, and often how quickly the customer would receive it. And this was true for anything the store sold. So imagine ordering apples, um, flour, and rice, um, and never seeing the products until they were dropped off at your house. Having a good relationship with a clerk was crucial in this kind of system. Grocery stores themselves, as you might imagine, were intensely social. We often hear about corner stores as bedrocks of community, and in important ways, they really were. Grocers wrote letters for customers who could not write. They kept up with neighborhood news and informed residents of each other's actions. And yeah, you, you are already tittering. Um, in the words of one um, sociology student in 1931, the neighborhood grocer, quote, knows their family troubles and family joys. He knows when a child is born, when a boy or girl has married, he is often solicited to help influence certain relatives who also patronize the store. Grocers, in other words, were central figures in social fabric. And in some ways, this is an extremely appealing image. Um, it's appealing, I think, because it's so easy to think of social encounters as good ones. But they, of course, they weren't always. Um, and I often, I increasingly actually, came to think of grocery stores as charged spaces. In these stores, stakes were high. Grocers resented customers who ran up balances and then didn't pay. Customers resented grocers who were asking them to pay, and they might avoid them or go outside of the neighborhood when they needed help so as not to embarrass themselves. And when you needed help or were being pressured by a grocer, the struggles were visible, palpable in these stores. One grocer remembered in the early 1930s, customers coming, quote, they kneel down, just like to the Lord, you know? Please give me, my children are starving. So we gave. In all of these cases, social bonds could fray or be reinforced depending on individual actions. Racial and ethnic differences, more common than we might imagine in congested urban areas, informed these everyday dynamics. Foreign language newspapers kept up constant campaigns to encourage members of particular ethnic communities to avoid rival businesses and support their own. One Slovakian paper warned that non-Slovaks, quote, may be your enemy. Certain groups, particularly Eastern European Jews and African Americans, were subject to particular levels of surveillance. One Polish newspaper ran a series referring to Jewish peddlers as vermin who exploited Poles. Here I have um, two cartoons, or two images, which sort of illustrate the ways that ethnic and racial tensions could infiltrate grocery stores. Um, the one on the top, your left, um, is a picket that was part of a larger fair employment movement organized by the Urban League and other interracial and African American groups. Um, this had different local presence in different parts of the United States, but was actually part of a national campaign that to ask local small scale grocery stores that refused to hire African Americans to start doing so. The other is um, 
a car an editorial cartoon that was published in the Chicago Tribune at the height of post-World War I inflation. There was a big inflationary surge at the end of World War I. And if you can read some of the dialogue there, um, they're complaining, this is a hold up, sort of your stereotypical 1920s um, Young, young adults in cars being held up by gangsters, but they say they gave all their money to the grocer, so they can't pay. I want to be clear that being a member of the same ethnic group as this, this bottom cartoon suggests didn't necessarily solve the problem. In Chicago and elsewhere, Jewish women frequently protested the prices charged by kosher butchers on whom they were dependent for meat. Black grocers resented women customers who traded with lower priced white grocers and who didn't, in their view, have enough race pride. Indeed, ethnic groups of all kinds blamed women customers for failures of their businesses. The surveillance of community stores could be stifling or unwelcome, even at some moments, even if it was helpful at other moments. The entrance of mass retail and chains addressed some of these resentments largely by making stores less social places and also by charging lower prices, which was particularly important in the 1920s when chains really came on the scene strongly. The first chains of stores had appeared in the first decades of the 20th century. a and had a national chain at the very turn of the century. But it was not until later, in the inflationary boom of the late 19-teens and early 1920s, the chains became a common presence in most people's lives. These stores were not larger than conventional neighborhood stores, but they did often promise freedom from stultifying community. And they also promised lower prices. So this is a quote from an ad. A woman does not like to run a gauntlet of clerks looking her over when she enters a store. In Piggly Wiggly stores, this cannot happen, for no one but the checker is in front and his back is usually to the door. Ads featured straightforward lists of products and prices, and chains promised that their scientific techniques, buying in scale, standardizing stores and items, allowed them to sell for less. Chain stores grew quickly by any measure. Um, and I'll just give you one quick illustration of this. Um, a&P, which had one of the first chains, had a few thousand stores in 1920. They had a little less than, right around 4,000. Um, by 1929, only um, 10 years later, or no, 20 years later, 10, sorry. Um, I'm a historian, not a mathematician. Um, <laughs> they had 15,000 stores. That was the year that they did a billion dollars in sales, which made them the fifth largest corporation in the United States. So chain grocery stores really came on the scene strong and became very important players in all kinds of ways. Now, that statistic um, and what we all know happened over the course of the 20th century makes it seem like an obvious story. It's easy to assume that chains naturally and inevitably came to dominate quickly. But they didn't fully dominate. And here the story gets a little bit complicated. Um, in fact, their idea of streamlined selling um, didn't work a lot of the time. Even in the years after chain groceries grew astronomically in terms of sales and numbers, there was more, not less, unsettledness in food shopping. Individual women continued to wrest personal attention from grocers. Chains expanded too quickly and found themselves operating tens of thousands of tiny stores forced into very long leases. And state and federal governments, previously uninterested in these very small businesses, began to take a new look at grocery stores intervening onto the shop floor. So this picture gives a sense of the limits of chain's efforts at standardization and depersonalization. This is a store that was supposed to feature self-service. So you can see the obvious problem, right? Only a giant could reach this food. <laughs> Um, customers would have had to continue to rely on a clerk to get them what they needed and almost certainly would have engaged in conversation about the best deals, what else was coming into the store, what was going on in the neighborhood, all kinds of things. So I think I like this image because it so nicely captures um, what words can't really convey. This was self-service. 
The first supermarkets also appeared around this time period and began to garner national attention by the early 1930s. But these were not the national, standardized, streamlined mass marketers we might imagine. This is a picture of um, one of the many supermarkets that claims to be the first supermarket. I'll just warn you before you go check me on this. Um, this is Haddam, this was called Haddam's Supermarket. It was in Los Angeles, opened in 1927. And supermarkets in, particularly in Los Angeles and in Pasadena, often featured this very elaborate Moorish architecture. I don't know if you can see, this one has a fountain in front right there. Um, Inside, you would have found a coffee shop, a florist, a deli, and many other services. This was open 24 hours a day, which was unheard of in, um, for any store, especially a grocery store. What it didn't have was parking. Um, in fact, parking was not considered necessary for these early supermarkets. Um, and some, I couldn't get a picture of it, but there were supermarkets in Los Angeles which were drive-through supermarkets. And I don't have myself a firm idea of how it worked, but apparently you drove your car up and you could sit there and they would go and get the food and bring it to the car. Which I, I like that idea because it suggests how differently people imagined food shopping working in the 1920s. This is a, actually a more typical early supermarket. And you can see how warehousey it looks. Um, this is from a little later in 1937. Um, but this was how Certainly, supermarkets on the East Coast and in much of the Midwest appeared um, larger, much less fancy, a little bit ungainly, also without a lot of parking. Um, and inside, you still would have found a huge array of goods and services, um, but not always terribly well organized. Indeed, most chain store firms rejected supermarkets and refused to open supermarkets precisely because they seemed so ungainly. Um, they were not wrong about the atmosphere in some supermarkets. These were extraordinarily large and featured a dizzying array of goods. Um, they were more like a hyper super target um, than the kinds of supermarkets we imagine now. People derisively, a lot of the early supermarkets were called Big Bear or Big Bull. They often had big in the title. Um, and critics called them wild animal stores because of their names. Um, and often because of the sort of un disorderly behavior that they seemed to engender. Opening days brought lines that stretched around the block, spectacular giveaways, and often the police. Um, supermarkets were successful, but often short-lived and decidedly disrespectable in the eyes of most grocers. Critics called them Depression-era babies, confident that they would disappear when good times returned. It's not only early supermarkets that point to ongoing complications at the checkout line. At the same time, a surge of activism unsettled the distribution, the, di the distribution system as a whole. Consumer cooperatives, efforts to give women authority over stores by the government, especially during World War II, all of this unsettled grocers and made implementing mass retail and chain's desire for standardization much more difficult. Slowly, these challenges dissipated. And I can talk more if people are interested about the reasons for this, and especially um, talk about the heightened increase in consumer activism and concurrent fears of women shoppers during the interwar period. For now, I want to focus on how stores had been transformed and came to be transformed by new ways of thinking about women and what women wanted. Slowly, over time, grocery shopping was transformed. By the 1950s, stores looked like the kind we're used to. They seemed orderly, they featured elaborate planning, both in their supply systems, but also in their pallets and, in, and internal organization and use of space. And they promised modern advantages, like refrigerated meat and automated doors. Supermarkets took on enormous rhetorical significance as symbols of the bounty and excitement of capitalism and post-war life. They also proved extremely popular. The Supermarket Institute, a trade association founded with 35 members in 1935, had 7,000 members by 1950. One 1951 article 
claimed that supermarkets had been opened at a rate of three a day during the previous year. And these stores did big business. Although supermarkets made up only 4% of all grocery stores, they accounted for 44% of all retail food sales in 1952. So they very immediately became important in all kinds of ways. The typical grocery, whether chain, independent, or cooperative, got larger, more modern, more orderly, and more streamlined. Regardless of how a store was owned or who shopped there, more and more grew larger, featured self-service, and stopped many of the services that had characterized them. So these are two pictures. On the upper left is a picture of a conventional supermarket that, had, that opened in Chicago in the early 1950s. And on the bottom right is a consumer cooperative that expanded into a supermarket. And you can see, um, I was struck when I found these pictures about how similar, even the way the photograph was taken, right? These stores are showcasing similar aesthetics and had similar organization that's very streamlined and graphic um, and with easily accessible goods, different from the earlier self-service. So popular did supermarkets become that over time, their absence from neighborhoods came to be taken as an indication of a food desert. The first studies of food inequality used the presence or absence of a supermarket as itself the marker of whether or not there was access to food in a neighborhood. This has become less common and people have developed more complicated metrics for this, but the solution to food in inequalities is still in many places to encourage large supermarkets to move in. Of course, large supermarkets did not totally eclipse other kinds of stores, but increasingly shopping in other ways or demanding other things from stores came to seem and to be non-normative. Something as basic as demanding help from a clerk or stopping to talk with a neighbor, previously not only normal in grocery stores but almost required, um, now was disruptive. Journalists of the time criticized women who stopped, quote, shopping carts askew to gossip in the aisles. <laughs> women, one said, shouldn't go to the store to visit with their neighbors. Surveys, comment cards, and increasingly elaborate tools of surveillance replaced the one-on-one -on -one communication that had characterized food shopping in previous decades. Spatial politics changed as well. Rather than a store on every corner, there were now fewer stores, and they were more likely to be located in areas of higher income or on the fringes of cities or suburbs. Small stores continued to exist as important sites of shopping, but they struggled with palpable differences, as did their customers. Both paid a high price, both financially and also socially, in less access to national brands and to the celebrated consumer citizenship of the mid 20th century. This was actually an important shift in American life and I wanna just stop here to point out that now where one shopped, as much as what one bought, marked social class. Whereas in previous decades, class may have been marked by the ability to afford food or by what one served, in later years the sort of place in which food was procured was itself a mark of class. So early in the 20th century, almost everyone bought food from peddlers or from, um, from local corner grocers that operated in roughly similar ways. There was much more divergence as by the middle of the century. Just as important as the actual growth of supermarkets was how that growth was explained. Beginning in the 1950s and 1960s, the, the growth of supermarkets was explained over and over and over by the importance of consumers' demands and desires, and particularly women's desires. The head of Publix grocery stores in Florida explained his stores were, quote, what women would design if they designed supermarkets. And he called food, food selling a woman-haunted business. Um, these are publicity shots of one of his, um, actually one of his most famous stores in Fort Lauderdale. Um, public stores were famous for their bright colors, which you can see in these images, and also um, what was described as candy-striped marble floors. 
And I think that's, that floor is still in existence. But you can see how elaborate the decor is, um, the use of really bright colors, and the kind of um, festive but carefully controlled atmosphere in these stores. Publix wasn't alone in this. Kroger's explained that their new stores were planned, designed, and created for women like you. The corollary was that supermarkets simply gave women what they wanted. Now, I want to be clear that as a historian, I found that an inadequate explanation of how supermarkets or any other store grew, which is not to say it's unimportant, but just that there's other things too. In these accounts, supermarkets are the key not only to low-priced food, but also to much that was considered good in post-World War II consumer society. The abundance of products, the convenience that they offered housewives, the pleasures of shopping, the affordability of new goods, and the ways in which they facilitated family togetherness. Writers of magazine articles, textbooks, cookbooks, and political speeches created a rich discourse of conservative femininity in which women's desires revol revolved around low prices, variety, and elaborate decor. Unsurprisingly, accounts of women's grocery shopping differed remarkably from gritty account grittier accounts earlier in the century. One article in 1962 reminded women that supermarket shelves were, quote, bursting with excitement. Another asserted, quote, nowhere, nowhere else in the world is such an abundance of food so lavishly displayed and so reasonably priced. This is one of the most sort of has always epitomized that to me. This is the cover of um, Life magazine. They devoted an entire issue to the success of the American food system. See, special issue food. Um, and they chose the, this image for the cover of a woman's gloved hand pushing an extremely placid looking child in a shopping cart. Um, I think it's actually quite telling in this image that we can't see the woman's face. Her individuality is as unimportant and indeed a distraction from the smoothness of the image and the system. Supermarkets had their critics, and even these, like Vance Packard's Babes in Consumerland, with which I began, assumed that women somehow wanted and had become part of a dulled, homogeneous consumption. Indeed, the assumption was often that mass, if you thought that mass retailing was shallow, that it was that way because it reflected women's shallowness. In his essay, Sad Heart at the Supermarket, Randall Jarrell imagined a fictional interview with, quote, a vague, gracious figure, a kind of Mrs. America, asked what she did while waiting for the intercontinental ballistic missiles to fall, the figure in Gerald's fictional dialogue answered, I bought things. The promises of stores were in stark distinction to the experience of shopping in them, an experience that required more resources and labor than in the past. Checking store ads in newspapers, compiling shopping lists long enough to encompass a week's worth of meals, shopping around rather than concentrating purchases at a single store, locating a particular item among shelves and shelves of possibilities, comparing non-standardized sizes of canned goods, watching the register to avoid overcharges and to ensure that specials were noted, saving the coupons and trading stamps offered by stores and manufacturers, all these activities took time and energy that worked against the promises of supermarkets. Yet women did and were encouraged to do all of these things. One woman in 1968 summed up the work of shopping, quote, it is difficult enough to watch the children, check how the bags are being packed, please don't squeeze the bananas, watch that leaky roast, and count the change. But to add stamps, games, and coupons to all this is only insulting the shopper. These anecdotal accounts of the work of food shopping are reinforced by studies by social scientists. One of the first feminist sociologists, Joanne Vanek, concluded in 1974 that although time spent preparing meals had dropped between 1920 and the late 1960s, the work of shopping and driving to stores had increased so dramatically that virtually no time was saved. These tasks and effort were, importantly, not visible inside of stores. And this is a really crucial shift. Instead, the work of shopping was displaced onto station wagons, city buses, kitchens, apartments, and houses. The result was that slowly, over the course of several decades, 
modern streamlined supermarkets became important symbols of the benefits of consumption and modern life globally. The US government organized and helped fund overseas exhibits of supermarkets in nations suspected of leaning towards the Soviet orbit, especially places like Greece and Italy and Yugoslavia. The opening of overseas supermarkets and the joy of shoppers was nearly a trope of post-war news magazines. I'm just going to read you my favorite quote. One observer imagined, quote, thousands of Italian housewives feel the same as one old woman who gazed at the mountains of food in the American model supermarket and sighed, heaven might be like this. <laughs> and I don't want to actually undermine her, her excitement at that bounty of food. It really was distinctive, and it really was meaningful. But I'm interested in what that quote says about how Americans perceived supermarkets and how supermarkets came to epitomize all kinds of things about post-war American life. America and American supermarkets were sites of plenty. The world without them was a world of want. The same notion that supermarkets brought out the best was, of course, celebrated in texts geared to the domestic audience. In one textbook, the author celebrated the story of supermarkets is, in a very real sense, the story of America. The food industry is not great because of any unified power or monopolistic control. It is great because it answers a need, low-cost merchandising of food. So you can see how he's really positioning supermarkets as embodying capitalism and separate from government and other systems. These historical accounts that claim stores grew just by meeting demand can be read as valorizing much of the post-war world in ways that lots of public celebrations of Americanness did during the 1950s and 60s. But these writings did something else too. These, his these historical accounts obscured the politics surrounding supermarkets, the contingencies that led to their growth, and the long history and present state of women's difficult, complicated, and sometimes unsuccessful, ex unsuccessful experiences in retail food stores. The accounts conflated women's decisions about where to shop and what to buy with an expression of their ultimate demand and desire, and posited that demand as the center of the concerns of businesses. In this way of thinking, stores were isolated from contemporary tensions because their customers were also isolated from them. In moments when women and men clearly weren't isolated from other politics or problems, they became difficult fits with mass retail. So let me give you a couple of examples. The 1960s famously saw activists demanding equal treatment in stores, particularly in the South. In the North, there were a series of civil rights actions and outright attacks on supermarkets and grocery stores in the mid to late 1960s demanding equal employment, better quality goods, and better treatment in stores and neighborhoods. What's interesting to me is the response by um, trade associations to this, which was, to say the least, pallid. <clears throat> Supermarket executives offered to create a series of skits that would educate African Americans about how they might shop better and about the problems faced by large grocers. The president of the National Association of Food Chains asked for patience and sympathy when confronted by a Philadelphia housewife who said she had heard that chain supermarkets sold goods of lower quality in black neighborhoods. A Businessweek journalist paraphrased his reply. Adamy and his colleagues deny everything and then explain why it happens. <laughs> Suburban stores, they say, are bigger than ghetto stores with more parking space, roomier aisles, better display, and greater store traffic. The implication to experienced merchandisers is plain. Fresher product, greater variety. By contrast, land in ghetto areas is often costly and parking space in short supply. The result, fewer stores, cramped, crowded, and offering few products. And I want to point out that in these, these analyses were, spanned the political spectrum, both progressive and conservative in all of this. Poor Americans suffered not because of discrimination or racism, but through sadly unavoidable facts that their neighborhoods or buying styles were unsuited to large supermarkets. Put bluntly, the poor had to pay more. This is the inside of um, a supermarket in Chicago in 1968. Um, 
in the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination in Chicago, as in other places, there were a series of uprisings. Um, in Chicago, the mayor issued shoot to kill orders, um, partly in response, I think, to this sort of supermarkets had come to symbolize so much that was orderly that attacks on supermarkets were particularly disturbing. These are um, pictures of more um, organized conventional kinds of protests against supermarkets. So the upper right and the center one are from um, what was called Oper Operation Breadbasket. Um, and it was organized by Jesse Jackson. It was one of his first Chicago campaigns to pressure grocery stores, especially to hire more African-American clerks, very much like the 1930s protests. The one in the lower right is a photograph of a housewife's anti-inflation um, campaign, which kicked off in the early 70s. And what's striking to me is that the housewife's campaign engendered the same kind of response from grocers as civil rights um, efforts had. Um, when inflation struck supermarkets during the 60s and 70s, a series of housewives protests asked shoppers not to buy, particularly not to buy meat in stores, because meat had gone up in price especially. Um, they also um, complained about general high prices in grocery stores around food, which they ascribed to the extras that supermarkets offered, things like trading stamps or the fancy scenery and aesthetics. An executive explained that stores used these strategies because women wanted them, and hence the strategies increased volume and lowered prices for everyone. That clearly not everyone liked these strategies made those who didn't like them non-normative. What were they thinking after all? Didn't they want to, pay, to play store bingo? Mm -hmm. Passive shopping was now conflated with shopping itself and increasingly with femininity. In both of these cases, both the industry and self-proclaimed self consumer advocates refused to imagine that structural change was possible. Complaining individuals simply had to pay the price, both economically and socially, for not fitting the system of food distribution that had developed. The implication, although largely unspoken, was that the mass market apparently had to exclude large numbers of people, that it was really not so mass after all. The fact that this kind of shopping was seen as the norm, as the goal, has shaped ideas about the past as well as the present of food and food shopping. The popular conception of smooth running, streamlined supermarkets created an important legacy. In the minds of many Americans, grocery stores occupied a sphere that was outside of politics, power relations, or public life. Instead, stores merely stood, for better or worse, for effortless, pleasurable, mindless, and resolutely a political modern living. They did what we wanted them to do. And if we didn't like the results, the problem was our own inadequate choices. Critics of mass consumption fully accepted the idea that supermarkets and grocery stores were not places where real thought or labor happened. The powerful countercultures that arose in the late 60s and 70s cemented this view of supermarkets and often used them to represent the mainstream. The Clash, for instance, famously sang in 1979 that they were all lost in the supermarket. Supermarkets, whether they wanted to be political or not, symbolized the powerlessness many people felt in the face of modern life. And I think even now, rather than complain to managers, bargain with clerks, or demand changes to store policy right away, customers tend to leave and do their campaigning and complaining outside the store through electronic media or phone calls or emails or online posts or informal complaints to friends. Part of this is because communication is easier through these media than it was, but it's also because stores tolerate less overt confrontation. confrontation. Loud complaints or protests are the often unwelcome exception in grocery stores. And there are ways in which I see this sort of older supermarket ideal um, being reinforced in new formats. Um, this effort to find a way of provisioning that is relaxing and apolitical and pleasurable. Recent alternatives to supermarkets have included small stores and farmers markets, 
which are celebrated for restoring the pleasure to shopping and rekindling warm fires of community. That these places might be, as food shopping always was, a site of work, troubles many images, not only of how food stores work, but how they should work and how shoppers work. It is hard to imagine a system that takes labor and conflict and assertiveness as givens. I, I concluded my book by observing that in these moments of purchase, large systems are at stake. The question is only whether or not academics and citizens notice that and think in appropriately consequent deep ways. In this book, I tried to notice. What I noticed especially were the tight connections between social and economic systems present earlier in the 20th century, but largely absent now. Many artists or cultural critics came to posit modern supermarkets as here in the 1975 hit the Stepford Wives, as sites of order or passivity, or if you are more charitable, the pleasures of abundance of modern society and the value of choice. But the result are pretty impoverished notions of what motivates people when they shop and the complicated calculus involved in many grocery stores. The history of supermarkets and grocery stores then seemed not very interesting to people because the answer to their success was so obvious. They had given shoppers, and especially women shoppers, what women wanted. To question their success was to question broader social ideas about gender and what it was actually that women wanted. I hope the history I've presented here questions both of those things. I suggest that grocery stores were complicated, that they navigated a range of concerns, and that giving women what they wanted rarely followed a set ideal or plan. Indeed, women themselves, like grocers, were far less stable, less reliable, and less passive than many have thought. That we have come to see stores in this way makes this exhibit all the more important. It is these artists and others like them who I think continued and continue to insist that grocery stores are sites where interesting things come together in unpredictable ways. These artists noticed something I noticed too, that large systems that need stability and predictability can also be the easiest to upset. Sometimes the disruption is pleasurably and playfully done, and sometimes it's done with a harder edge. But that these everyday sites can be looked at differently, can be toyed with, can be used for statements about tribal sovereignty or about our individual likes and dislikes or health or about what is or isn't a commodity or about the artfulness of shopping lists. These paintings, installations, sculptures, photographs, performances, this art forces us to stop and look deeply at things we have moved past. I hope I've helped in that effort to make us see grocery stores and ourselves as full of possibilities with desire and demands that outstrip obvious choices. I hope I have helped to see the fullness and largeness of our desires and of what we bring to stores. Thank you. So, um, I am open to questions. Yeah. How do you see the mid 20th century passive, predictable shopper image moving on into early 21st century with the evolution of specialty chain, specialty organic, um, fresh markets, Trader Joe right. types of stores? Yeah, it's really interesting to me. Um, so, that, I should say that that transition to like this sort of explosion of interest in food and food politics happened as I was finishing the book. And I saw these incredibly strong parallels with the rhetoric that I was seeing. So for instance, um, I read um, a lot of the talk about local foods suggests that what's good about it is that you form a really warm, supportive relationship with the person who sells you the food. Um, that's less true of a place like Trader Joe's, but even there the idea is that it's supposed to make you happy, right? And then the mark of the success of a store is that 
people are satisfied with what it offers you, right? Rather, which obscures what is actually required to shop, right? Which is a lot of planning and thinking and not always full satisfaction at what you get, but the ability to make do. So I see this, you know, historians are trained to look for change, and I saw a lot of that, but I have also been struck by the continuity in some of that rhetoric. But it's also a, a measure of class to shop in these types of stores also. There's I think, class difference. yes, I think that, that, that there is a big, um, that, it's, that it's a big mark of class, I would agree. That, I mean, class has always been at play in food shopping, but, I, but now where you shop, right? And whether you shop at even something like Sam's Club or Super Target, right? can say something about your class in very nuanced ways. And that's a big change. Yeah. Have you done a study on the fragility of the distribution system where it starts with the originator and goes to the distributor right. and then the retailer? That is a great question. I didn't because I wanted to finish this book. Um, <laughs> But it, is a, but it is begging to be studied. And actually, um, one of my colleagues at the University of Minnesota is working on um, wholesaling in this time period. And one big problem that wholesalers encountered, or the, I'm sorry, that independent grocers encountered was the sort of the desiccation, the drying up of their suppliers and their supply chains. So that supply network is in some ways, and, and the infrastructure of grocery stores um, is very complicated and also undergoes a transformation in this time period. Yeah, in the back. Your talk just brought back a lot of memories of, you know, uh, and I'm wondering if grocers had a response. What I remember um, from the 60s was the boycott, like the great boycott. Right. Yes, um, that's right, there was. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't the same. It, how, it was, it, you know, and women played a very important role in that. Um, and so I'm wondering, what did grocers have responses to those kinds of actions by women? Um, they had responses. Um, and they varied greatly, right? Some grocers were supportive of women and agreed the prices were too high, and they blamed the supply network or their suppliers for, for those prices. Um, some grocers um, felt that women were being sort of um, aggressive and that women didn't understand. Not so much that they didn't sympathize with them, but it was just such a complicated system that women couldn't possibly understand it. And so they needed to understand why these prices were so high. Um, I was actually telling a group of graduate students today that the, those boycotts in the late 60s and early 70s are very much an untold story, and if anyone's looking for a project, that's a great one. Um, they're really, really interesting, and I suspect that responses were also tied up in racial politics of the time period, so that responses, and this is a guess, that responses um, in poorer urban areas um, were probably different than responses in very fancy suburban supermarkets. Yeah. Has there ever been a history of women ownership of, I mean, was there any women owning the small stores and then when the change came, then there was none? Well, you just gave that history. Oh. Um, the small grocery stores were often owned by women or um, owned by a family, typically by a couple, and, and, and both husbands and wives would work at the store. Um, Chain grocery stores, like most large businesses, didn't employ women in executive positions. So um, even during World War II, when there was a huge shortage of male clerks, um, they, were, they were slow to hire women and very slow to hire them into um, management, into managerial positions. What they did do was to create internal, in large chain stores, they created internal, basically, product development or home economics departments, and those departments were largely staffed by women, and it was that was how women sort of moved up through the corporate ladder in the mid 20th century was through these home economics. And is that still the case? Um, it is still the case that there aren't many women, but there are more. They began, especially in the 70s and 80s, like most of corporate America, they started hiring women slowly into um, higher up. 
into more white collar positions. How, how gendered is the shopping experience today, let's say compared to generations? Um, do you mean like how much do people feel their gender when they shop? No. Or how is it different from? <laughs> Oh, who does the shopping? Um, it, it, ha it is, I am basing this on a lot of different sources. Um, men do more grocery shopping now than they would have, you know, as a sort of um, summary statement, they do more now than they would have done in the 50s and 60s. Um, the division of household labor in general is moving closer to parity, although it is still the case that women do more. And what is interesting to me is that certain kinds of labor around food have changed more than others. So men may do more shopping, but it's not clear to me, and I haven't seen any studies that suggest that they do more thinking and worrying about what's gonna be served. So sort of the organization around food and the, um, the, the labor of thinking about what's gonna work for different days and strategizing, my sense is that typically from what I've seen in the studies, that's, that part of it is still gendered. Although, one thing I would say is that it is different in every household, and it has always been different in every household. So even when all these grocers were saying, um, women are your most important customers, women are the buyers, it was never the case that only women shopped. It was, it, what has been consistent is the belief that women are the most important shoppers. But it has not been consistent that only women did the shopping. Yeah. that people have made and the various types of people um, who do those. And in an earlier discussion about this, we raised the question whether lists were also gendered as to what men and women do as lists. You know, there's the Oreo and beer guy <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> in the display. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know about making, if making lists is particularly gendered, but the, um, the sort of the sense of responsibility for the food that comes into a household and keeping things going through the week, um, I, I suspect that is still somewhat gendered, although I'm a historian, so we all like to say that's outside my time period. Yeah. Right. That's a really excellent question. Um, Pre-supermarket, it varied a lot, right? Because most grocery stores were smaller, and so it depended a lot on that particular grocer and their relationship with suppliers. Um, and on things like these big, pub oops, these big public markets at which people would buy foods. So that was one reason that, that shopping required that kind of level of personal trust and relationship. One thing I will say is that um, there was more, in some ways, what I was struck by in the study was how access to fresh food was much more available, even in poor and sometimes especially in poor and working class neighborhoods earlier because of their proximity to public markets and because of peddlers, not so much because of grocery stores, but because there were other food businesses that brought fresh food, very fresh food, into neighborhoods every day and that you could buy in very small amounts. Yeah. Tracy, why don't you close with um, your current <laughs> oh, sure. interests, research, and how this has dovetailed into other projects? Sure. So um, I, f I decided I was interested in what people did with the food after they bought it in the store. And so my new project is a biography of Julia Child. Um, and I'm, she is really fascinating. Um, and I, the way I tell people about this is to say that it's, you know, I'm a historian. So I want to know what Julia Child has to say to us about the 20th century, and particularly the, those middle decades. And what is remarkable to me as I follow the paths of her life is the way that she points to the centrality of food, and particularly the centrality of 
um, fresh, laboriously prepared food in American life over those middle decades, which was a real historical shift for most people. So um, stay tuned. I'm looking forward to doing that work. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much.